Um, I'm Tiffany Canini. I'm the project manager for Kauai Invasive Species Committee. Uh, how Hawaii Ant Lab. Hi, I'm Michelle Montgomery. I'm uh, the research specialist at Hawaii Ant Lab. Thank you. Heather. Good morning. My name is Heather Forrester. I'm the extension specialist here at the Hawaii Ant Lab uh, ELO office. Thank you, Heather. So I would also like to thank uh, Kix Outreach, Helen Cho, and also HDOA technician, Eric Garcia, uh, who, are, who are in the team, response team, or this organizing, this webinar organizing team as well. And, and before we start, I would ask Craig to introduce himself and start his talk. Craig, introduce and start. Um, I'm Craig okay. Kaneshige from the Department of Agriculture. Um, not a speech specialist, uh, but we do all everything from bees to insects and um, work for plant pest control branch. Okay. Um, just, a, just one moment. I would also like to thank uh, Ray. I, I don't know how to how to pronounce his last name. Kahau Nale. Ray is the operation manager of KISC. If he is around here, I don't know. Ray. Okay, so yeah, Ray is also a part of a, the main part of the response team as well as uh, also this organizing team. Okay, Craig, go ahead. Yeah, so, so Roshan, um, how's that? That's good. Okay, um, okay, I'm gonna give a presentation on uh, a little fire ant, uh, just Wait. for the basic, yes? Wait, can you, uh, is, 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 what do you call, I don't know, make in lot in last full screen. Um, there is a clock button, yeah, at the, at the bottom, you click there, here. Okay, you are close to there, yeah, not there, not that one, right. No. All the way. Yeah, yeah, this one, yes. Click it. Okay, good. Great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna give a, a, a light presentation on the little fire ant and the history of it on Kauai and uh, what, what is doing, KISC and how is trying to do, uh, how to control ants, okay? Um, Okay, how to recognize a little fire ant? Yeah, it's um, pale orange in color, uh, tiny, about 1 16th of an inch. And then all worker individuals are the same size. The queen is larger than the workers, so is the, the drone is a little bit bigger. Uh, the behavior is very slow moving and it, it readily um, falls off um, bait sticks. And it, we prefer oily baits. Um, peanut butter is highly attractive and uh, dense um, stings when pressure is applied, like uh, when it's, it's in between your clothes and your skin. Uh, okay, Roshan, um, how you get to the, you know, the thing you read, you read it underneath. Oh. Uh, you know, like, um, the, your notes right? yes yeah how you i i, I don't know <laughs> so you have a okay. notes at the bottom yeah i yeah I, I cannot tell now i don't know how okay um yeah anyway okay uh, oh. so not this you, you clicked here yeah not that one Okay, yeah, okay. That'll be this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, okay, I'll just try to do it from there, yeah. Okay, um, the sting of the ant, uh, it forms red welts with a small blister, and it can last for two weeks, and it's very irritating. And then, um, like, there's some pictures of the uh, sting. There is the belly of the, a dog, and it seems like us, yeah. Uh, we have the same welt. And um, it causes blindness in animals. Um, 
you know, um, cats and dogs, uh, chickens, and a lot of uh, wildlife. And um, they eat nests in cracks and crevices and, and in the crotches of trees and other plants. And it's, you know, if we find it in rocks, leaf litter, potted plants, and other debris. Um, the first infestation of LFA was found at uh, Kalihi Y. It was brought in an untreated container of palms from Hawaii Island. And the initial infestation was um, about 100 square feet. It's about 10 feet by 10 feet. But they um they treated, this is in 2000, the year 2000, and 25 acres was treated, and it was thought to be eradicated, but actually it remained at um, undetectable levels. And then um, in 2003, when I started work in 2001, but um I had to get like, get with the program and find out what needs to be done. We found um, the LFA in 2003. And um, I found out that uh, it infested the um, Kalihi Y. And um, at that time, there was no method to treat the trees and the LFA just covered, covered the area, a large area. Um, it was spotted around, spotted in different, different parts of the 25 acres. And then um, it took us almost 17 years to get it completely under control. Right now, um, I would say it remains at undetectable levels. We haven't found um, any ants yet since 2018. Um, the surprising part is of uh, the ants, the little fire ant. Um, when we when we did surveys, we found it all the way to the bottom of the um, the edge of the ocean along the water line, the lower water line, and then it goes from all the way from the water line to the top, the top goes on um, where the water line uh, reaches. Um, and we we the terrain at Kalihi Y was um, kind of bad. We had to go and climb hills and a lot of um, go to shrubs and how bush and a lot of things you have to, in order to um, survey and treat the areas. Okay, um, so we worked on st st steep terrain, laying vials and sticks uh, to monitor um, the little fire ant. Um, so everyone, um, Hawaii Ant Lab, Hawaii Indigenous Species Committee, and Hawaii Department of Agriculture, um, people were certified to repel down the cliff to survey and treat the little fire ants. Um, we covered six acres. Um, the elephant infestation was reported by a pest control agency in Kilauea town um, in August of 2019. And it was identified and confirmed by H2A's entomologist the infested site was treated and surveys are being continued. Um, KISC and H2A have not found LFA so far, and the next survey is scheduled for November um, 2021, um, next month. This is to um this is part of the first quarter that um we haven't found any ants yet, but we trying to survey and and um and see how long until the ants are, if they're at undetectable levels or, or okay. So the third infestation is at um, Moloa, Moloa, and it was found in this year, 2021. And a concerned farmer submitted suspected LFA samples um, to KISC, and HDOA identified and confirmed the LFA in July, 2021. Um, KISC and H2A did the limiting surveys and found it covers about 13 acres. Um, by the limiting surveys, uh, what it means is um, 
in order to um, treat, before we treat or do anything, we have to find out where the ants are. And you know, we do survey the whole area just to find out um, where the ants are. If we find one positive, then we go out um, further out, maybe 10 meters and up to 30 meters out to see if we find any more. And if you find another another one within the 30 meters, we have to go out 30 meters more. So we just have to keep on surveying and all. Uh, yeah, we've done our survey and um, we found it covers about 13 acres. And um, the treatment plan uh, that we use is developed by Wyatt Lab. And we thank them because um, without, without the treatment, the, uh, the ants uh, are arboreal, where it means uh, it lives in the trees. And the first, when the first um, ant sites at Kalihiwai, uh, when they treated the area, we had no uh, way of treating the trees and you know trees and using different um, types of baits. So um, all the baits was developed developed by Hawaii Ant Lab, and we thank them a lot. The okay, first treatment plan was applied on September 21, 2021, at um, Moloa and will be repeated every six weeks for up to a year. And the sites later on uh, will be surveyed every quarter to check the effect of the treatments. And um, this is to the farmers or people who suspect LFA. Now, it is important that you don't treat the LFA on your own. The reason being that you might chase the LFA to new areas and um, it will make our job harder because we'll have to keep on um, moving out into a, within the buffer zone and see how widespread it is. Okay, in summary, the LFA can have a huge impact on the agriculture industry, wildlife, and native animals. Uh, public nurseries and agriculture businesses need to be aware of transporting, importing, and exporting all products that includes pen materials, lumber, pallets, and, and even um, like cement tiles. We have found um, ants in different material that comes to different um, comes from different islands to Kauai. Uh, for any suspects and sightings of LFA, the public growers and agribusinesses need to inform either KISC or H2OA. They can contact us at Hawaii Department of Bag at 808-241-7132 or use the statewide hotline at 643-PEST-7378. Kauai Species Species Committee at 808-821-1490. Do you have any questions? Uh, thanks, Craig. There is uh, already a lots of questions. Maybe we should uh, uh, go go to the next presentation, then discuss later on. Yeah, there will be a lot more clearer picture after a couple of more uh, presentation. I think. So, okay, thank you, Craig, and I would like to invite Heather Forrester Hall to talk about some of the basics, little fire ant one hundred and one. Heather. Whenever you are ready. Heather, you're muted. Yes, muted. <laughs> Great. Story of my life. <laughs> um, good morning. Thank you all for being here and taking the time out of your days. Uh, hopefully some others will be able to see the recording, but Educating ourselves on the monsters that we're dealing with is really important because with ants in general, I mean, we go by most of our lives, uh, maybe noticing the ants, but this species is very different and it has a lot of negative impacts to us. So today I'm gonna cover uh, 
a little bit about the Hawaii ant lab, as well as um, the monsters that we're dealing with, and then talk about how, we, how to detect them on your own properties. So first off, who the hell is Hal anyways? Uh, we're a program of the University Pacific, Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit. And our uh, mission has four main points. We look to uh, prevent any new intentional or unintentional introductions of invasive ants. Uh, so we're not only on the lookout uh, for little fire ants, but we're looking for also new species uh, that could be coming to the islands. We look to prevent the inter and intra island spread of uh, primarily the little fire ants. And the only thing that we can really do with that is education. Uh, we don't have any authority to stop people from moving things. But for example, we've had people come in to our big island office with a bunch of coconuts and they wanted to ship it to Maui. And uh, sprouted coconuts are a great example of a way that little fire ants can spread. Uh, so rather than giving them treatment advice, we just uh, said that it was not a good idea to move that material. But the Department of Ag uh, does have the authority to stop uh, that movement and the inspections are, are great that they do uh, here on Big Island before the materials even have a chance to move. Uh, there's also other ways that it can be spread just on an airplane itself. Someone could take some fruit or cut flowers from one island to the other, and uh, because it's not screened, that is a potential way that it could be spread to other islands. On Big Island, primarily what I work to do is uh, provide sound treatment methods for homeowners, uh, farm, farmers and industry, uh, little fire ants really impact everyone. And it's a, it's a big set of shoes to fill. Whenever possible, we look to eradicate uh, these new incursions. On Big Island, we look, look at management, but fortunately on the neighbor islands, we have the opportunity to collaborate with DOA and ISCS and other organizations to nip it in the bud before it spreads too far. We're funded by the Hawaii Invasive Species Council, Department of Agriculture, and other competitive grants. Our website is littlefireants.com, uh, where you can find out information more on biology, how to survey. Uh, don't look at the treatment because uh, the Department of Ag and KISC will be there to help you on that uh, part to do the treatments correctly. I want to stress that collaboration is key and at the heart of um, the solution is really in uh, residents, industry, and farmers. And it really takes a village, uh, in fact, an entire state. So sometimes there's some finger pointing like, oh, we got this from Big Island. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, let's try to all work together. Little fire ants, why are they a problem? How, how did they get here and why should we even care? In Hawaii, we have over 60 species of ants, none of which are native. Uh, we have a couple of uh, fire ants. Fire ants are ants that have the common name because of their fiery or burning sting. And these are going to have different biology and behaviors, and therefore they require different treatment methods. One misconception when people think about fire ants is the tropical fire ant. We've had these for quite some time. They'll form mounds, and when disturbed, can run up your leg and sting you. Uh, but that's a different species and a different monster than the little fire ant. Little fire ants do not form mounds. They move into ready-made homes and they can um, also live up in the trees for their entire lives. Typically when people 
uh, interact with or get stung by little fire ants. Uh, they're raining out of the trees, getting stuck in our clothing or a fold of skin and stinging us that way. Another species that we're on the lookout for that has not yet been detected in Hawaii is the red and corded fire ant. And that's a bigger, badder ant that we definitely don't wanna to have to deal with as well. One word of caution is that though the little fire ant does sting, people can live with them on their property for several years without even noticing them. But when their numbers uh, reach certain densities and they're moving up into the trees, that's really when we're coming into contact with them. They're not actually aggressive towards us, but when uh, we're disturbing them by uh, trapping them in our clothing, then that's oftentimes how people will notice. Uh, when in doubt, make sure you submit a sample of any uh, ant that looks similar to the little fire ant because there are lookalike species. Uh, some people will not they say, oh, I'm not getting stung, so I don't have the little fire ant. That's also a misconception. So narrowing in on the little fire ant, uh, they're considered one of the world's top 100 worst invasive species. With other species of ants, they'll uh, compete with each other for resources and territory. But the little fire ants are all genetically identical to each other and they're all working together as one big happy family. One colony of little fire ants can fit inside of a macadamia nutshell, have half a dozen queens, and lay an average of seven eggs per day. And with all these ants working together, you can get very high densities of them throughout your properties. Little fire ants are native to Central and South America. Uh, the, the ants that we have here in Hawaii are genetically identical to those uh, found in Florida. So that's likely uh, where we, we got this uh, invasive species from. LFA were first detected in Hawaii in 1999 in Lower Puna on the Big Island. And um, as Craig mentioned before, at that time, there were only ways to treat the ground, uh, but not up into the trees. So you can imagine killing off the ants on the ground, clearing some more space for the ones in the trees to reproduce and then repopulate the ground. But fortunately, uh, we do have methods to treat them three-dimensionally now. Little fire ants are reddish brown in color, about as long as a penny is thick and relatively slow moving. Because they're a tropical rainforest species, they nest in warm, moist, and shady places. Anything from uh, trees, palms, vegetation, uh, leaf axes, in and under potted plants, mulch, on the ground, uh, rock walls, leaf litter, crevices, they're very opportunistic. So they move into ready-made homes. They're not excavating their nests. Um, the colonies are small. As I mentioned, the size of a macadamia nutshell is an entire colony, but these colonies are numerous with multiple queens. Naturally, they spread through what's called budding so once a colony has reached capacity, a queen and several workers will branch off nearby and start up a new home, uh, but they're all continuing to work together. So we really need to look at this as a super colony. It's not just about killing the ants that we see um, or saying, oh, there's a mound, uh, let's kill them at the mound, because again, they're not forming mounds. Uh, but dealing with it as a three-dimensional super colony. It's very important to understand that little fire ants are hit a hitchhiker species. So it's really us that's moving them around. People often ask how quickly do little fire ants spread? And I like to say 45 miles an hour in the back of your truck. So it's really us that's moving them around. All you need is a single fertile queen and several workers to start up a new colony. 
there was a question in the chat about is there the potential for fruit being sold um, to be infested? And I like to use a pineapple top as a great example. If you have a pineapple that's been in an infested area and there's a queen with several workers that is hunkered down in the crown of the pineapple and you go to the farmer's market and buy that, twist off the top, throw it in your compost, you're basically planting um, a infestation of little fire ants. So that's how easy uh, they can be spread. They're a pest to humans as well as animals. They're stinging us uh, with their rear end, similar to a wasp. One ant can sting multiple times and the reaction is gonna vary uh, person to person. But with that sting, they inject a protein that we have a histamine reaction to. Uh, it, it's really changing the way of life uh, here on Big Island, as well as other locations that are infested throughout the state. Another uh, impact that will tug at your heartstrings is the impact to domestic pets and livestock. Because our pets cannot dig out the ants from the eye, they can sting multiple times and cause a clouding of the cornea called keratophathy, and that can potentially lead to blindness. Um, that was also a question in the chat that uh, we're not seeing that that's a reversible issue. Just because you have clouding of the eye in your pets doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it is a little fire ant sting because there are other causes, but we see a, a large correlation with that here on Big Island. They're also a pest to agriculture. So little fire ants are very effective at farming homopteran insects. These are things like aphids, scale, mealybugs. And the ants will feed off of the sweet honeydew nectar that they produce. When I say they farm them, they tend to them and literally move them around like we would move around cattle. The buildup of black city mold uh, from all of the homopteran insects uh, can damage crops, stunt growth, uh, and have fruit spoilage, cause fruit spoilage. One of the biggest impacts that we see here on the Big Island is that workers are getting stung during harvest and they're refusing to pick. Dealing with the management of LFA also adds to pest control costs. Another impact is to industry, uh, landscapers and tree, tim tree trimmers uh, are being paid premium wages to manage infestations. Um, they're also getting stung and it's impacting uh, the landscape. Tourism can potentially be affected as well as real estate. This cartoon is from our boss and typically we see a pest and we just wanna zap it right there, get the gratification of it, of it dying. But once you understand the colonial structure of the little fire ant, we'll understand that this is not the best uh, way to attack them. We need to really look at this as a super organism. Uh, the little fire ants are geared towards colony preservation. Again, there are multiple queens in one small colony. And uh, the queens are gonna be larger and darker than the worker ants. Males are around for one reason, and that's reproduction, and then they die. The ants that we're being stung by and typically see are the worker ants. Those little tiny ants that uh, are such a problem are all females. And the ones that we see are only about 10% of the colony. Uh, they're going out to forage on food. The ants will uh, suck the liquid or oils out of their food source, store it in their crop, like a chicken has a crop, take it back to the colony and regurgitate it. We can use that behavior to our advantage when we uh, use the ant baits that are laced with a toxicant. So the main point here is that we want to make sure that we're killing off the queen and not just the workers. 
workers lifespan is about three months, whereas the queen is uh, around for several years. Once she's mated successfully, she's fertile for her entire life. Um, so that's a lot of ants that she's capable of producing. Also pictured here are the larva and um, the ants that are attending to them. All right, moving into survey and identification. Uh, one point I want to talk about first off is a lot of times we focus in on, you know, where are these ants, uh, but that's only a snapshot in time. If we look at a map and say, uh, here's some ants, and that can be misleading. So we always encourage people to survey for the little fire ants, no matter where you are, and to do it several times a year. Surveying for little fire ants um, is relatively easy to do on your home properties. You'll need some chopsticks, coffee stir sticks, any type of wooden sticks will do. Put a thin smear of creamy peanut butter. Uh, please don't dig out a big old scoop. Uh, the ants only need a small amount to uh, forage off of. And what, these, what this does is it acts as a lure to attract the ants. Different species are gonna be attracted to the peanut butter. Uh, so it's important to uh, put that in a Ziploc bag so that it can be identified for later. So once you've put out your sticks in shady, moist areas, you want to make sure that the peanut butter is in contact with the surface uh, where the ants can uh, find it. Little fire ants are bump and taste feeders, so they're not seeking these sticks out. Uh, they're running into it, telling their friends about it. You want to make sure, too, that you're not doing uh, your survey where the sticks are going to be in the direct sunlight, uh, that can be a deterrent for little fire ants. And you don't want to have a pouring rain uh, while you're doing the survey because that can also deter the ants. You can, once you wait about an hour, you can collect your sticks, put them in uh, Ziploc bags. Be careful when you pick up the sticks because sometimes the ants can be on the underside of the stick. Uh, label your bags. That's also very important so that you know what areas are infested. And then you can send your uh, dead ants by freezing them off the kiss for identification. Please be sure to include your contact information. And if you're mailing it, be sure you have adequate postage. Uh, from my understanding, the KISC is taking care of the identifications for Kauai. Uh, Craig, please correct me if I'm wrong if DOA also accepts samples. Um, but freezing them for 24 hours will kill them. Some areas to consider surveying are these high-risk areas uh, where you have more opportunity for the ants to come about. Quarantine areas, driveways, parking areas, piles of recently delivered materials, or really anything new that you brought onto your property, wood piles, uh, mulch, and compost. As I mentioned before, little fire ants can really hitch a ride on anything, so consider anything as suspect. We recommend uh, surveying at least once to twice a year but it's more ideal to survey more like four times a year uh, when or and or whenever you're bringing anything new onto the property. You can do a quick sort of the ants. Um, so are the ants small? Are the ants slow moving? And are they all the same uh, color throughout the body? The problem with the quick sort, you know, if you find a black ant, um, that's going to be an obvious one that it's not a little fire ant. But some of the features you may be unfamiliar with, or they could be subjective. So we always say, when in doubt, be conservative and consider it a suspect. 
Um, if you're having problems with any ants, you can submit those and uh, identify them to species and we can work with KISP on providing treatment advice for those. Even though uh, we've been doing ant IDs for years and years, we never make a determination out in the field. We always look at it under a microscope because it's such small features that we're looking for. Uh, two large segments called the antennal club, two spines, one on either side um, of the back, and then two petiole segments that connect um, the gaster and um, the abdomen of the ant. All right, I think we're gonna skip out on questions for now um, until the end of all the presentations, but I hope that with that presentation, um, you understand a bit more about the monsters that you're dealing with. There are also great resources online on how to survey. Um, so with that, good luck and go survey for some ants. Thank you, Heather. Uh... I will take uh, some time for a uh, one poll question. So I will. This is for the participants' demographic information for uh, for the federal requirement. Uh, it has only three, four questions. I will launch this poll, and it will stay for one minute. And this is only uh, not compulsory. If you like to answer, please answer. If not, you can just uh, ignore. So here we go the poll questions. It will stay for one minute. Rikan, the poll disappeared for me. I don't know if Is that it? happened to anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yeah I, to I can't see. Okay, let me let me redo it again. I think oh, it's there. there it yeah, it's back. It's back. Okay, I will keep for another minute. Can you see? I, I am only viewing the demographic information results. Mm -hmm. And it says I did not respond. Results, so. Me too, sorry. Yeah. Okay, just forget about this for now. Okay, <laughs> we, we will try it one more time later. It's racist anyways. Yes. <laughs> just, if not, that's still popped up. I didn't do anything. Okay. Okay, let's, let's go ahead with uh, Michelle's presentation on risk uh, reduction strategy. Michelle, please. All righty. Yes. Let's get this sharing. Um, I will, the, the problem with the poll may have been me because I didn't realize that when I exited out of the poll on my screen that it probably exited out on everybody's screen as a co as a co uh okay co uh, we will try one, one more time later <laughs> later in the sorry about that guys oh, no problem yeah. um here we go risk reduction uh, Okay, so my name is Michelle Montgomery. I am the research specialist at Hawaii Ant Lab. Um, I have been working for the Ant Lab for a bit over 10 years, and I was um, uh, heavily involved in with the eradication up at Kahili Vai. So I've been uh, I've been around, and I'm very familiar with the the issues on Kauai with uh, little fire ants. Um, 
And my background is uh, like my degree and my background is really in integrated pest management and in agriculture and stuff like that. So I have a, a big stake and a whole lot of interest in risk reduction and how to use different techniques for pest, insect pests in general. Um, and it sounds like about half of half of the people here are farmers. And so uh, on Kauai, and I'm this is really for you. Um, it's great information for everybody else, but it's, this is really geared for the farmers on Kauai uh, and what this whole situation really means for you guys. Uh, so basically, it, it comes down to complacency and apathy as being, you know, the number one enemy for stopping the spread of pests, no matter what it is. Um, a lot of people don't either don't realize that it's a problem and or they think, oh, it's a big island problem. It's not a Kauai thing. Um, or they think, it, you know, the, the situation's hopeless. And where why should I even put any effort in when it's just eventually going to go everywhere? Um, that's it, those kinds of mindsets. It really hinders any kind of prevention uh, efforts that everybody else is putting in. So being, uh, being that this ant hat was first detected on Kauai in 99, um, and there are now three um, confirmed detections to date, uh, there's likely going to be other detections in the future. Uh, you know, it's had time to be able to accidentally be spread um, from one place to another. People don't realize that what, what's going on. They, maybe they pick up some driftwood in an infested area and not realizing it and bring it back to their property. Who knows, there's a lot of different ways. People moving between islands, um, potentially bringing stuff with and packing all of their belongings with them. Um, um, something that was in the chat about uh, what, not plant poaching, it's um, plant smuggling. So people mailing and shipping plants without inspection, quarantine inspection, all of these different ways are, are different ways that um, it can have been introduced onto the island, right? And so even though you don't think that it's widespread, it's still essential for uh, you to spread the word that this is a serious issue. It could affect you um, and you just don't know it. It could affect your neighbors and they don't know it yet. Uh, so never assume. You know the whole, the old adage of, you know what happens when you assume? Well, uh, we don't want that to happen, right? We want um, lots of public awareness, reporting, if you think something is a little bit strange, you're just not sure, it's better to be safe than sorry, um, to just report it and find out. Um, so err on the side of caution for sure. Uh, right now, these are the three, like uh, as Craig was mentioning, these are the three um, locations where LFA have been found. Um, they're all fairly close to each other. Um, we don't really know. We know how the first one in Kalihivai uh, was introduced. It was brought in by um, some shipments of palms from an infested Big Island nursery. Uh, the infestation is in Kilauea. We don't really know how it happened. Uh, and Craig and Tiffany can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, it was suspected that it could have been brought in from uh, people that had moved uh, from the Big Island um, several years before into the, the neighborhood. Maybe it came with some of their possessions that they brought along. Uh, maybe it was unrelated. Um, the one in Moloa, I, I haven't heard any kind of speculation on how it was um, possibly introduced there. So something's going on. It could already be um, uh, being spread around locally from sharing of infested materials or moving infested materials around on island. It could also be something where it's being brought in um, and there's multiple reinfestations um, of the island from outside. So right now we just don't know 
it's better for you guys to be aware and just start working on your prevention now so that you don't get cut with your pants down, right? Uh, the different pathways um, is really essential for you to understand. Um, this is not, these lists right here is not an extensive list of pathways. There's so many different ways that people can be moving them around. Normally we are the ones that are doing it uh, by like, as Heather said, we're moving infested planting material, uh, machinery around. So like yard service equipment, mowers, tractors, whatever. Uh, I know I had bought a, a used pickup truck down in uh, Lower Puna, which is uh, widely infested with little fire ants. And I didn't really think about it because I live up Malka where it's not widespread or it's not um, known to occur. Um, and one day I noticed that my truck had fire ants. And so of course I was pulling my hair out thinking of course the ant lady is the one and bringing fire ants up to the area and not thinking about it. So all of these things, even um, professionals that work with these guys all the time, sometimes we have a lapse of judgment um, and it's important to think of comprehensively anything can be suspect. So always be aware of what you're bringing onto your property check it for a little fire ants with doing the peanut butter stick tests. Um, for you guys as farmers, um, these are the kinds of things that you really, really want to be thinking about. Um, you know, introducing new planting stock into your, onto your property. If you like purchase it from somewhere and bring it on, right? Uh, moving machinery between farms, between property. Um, that could potentially go from one infested site to another. Um, if you purchase or if you get um, communal mulch, compost, green waste, stuff like that is, is a big, is a big uh, pathway if it's not properly um, managed. Um, if you sell or share produce, let's say you are um, a, a grower within an infested area, there's different, the different features and different crops are going to carry different risk of harboring little fire ants and then you passing accidentally passing it along to somebody else. Um, there are also natural ways that these can spread besides budding. Um, mostly it's when uh, you're surrounded by an infested area. Uh, it can, you know, if you have big tall trees around and you get a strong storm, the ants can be blowing in from there. Uh, flood, uh, flood waters, waterways, streams, stuff like that. These ants will float and can infest along the banks and spread from there. Um, and so those are the main um, natural ways that those guys can be introduced onto your property and spread outwards. Uh, that, that also shows that no matter how vigilant you are, there's always a possibility um, that it can be introduced onto your property otherwise. So being on top of doing your, your surveys on a regular basis, whether that's once a year, uh, whether right now, maybe it's every other year, sooner than that, you know, more frequently would be better, obviously. Uh, to interrupt those pathways, uh, first thing is get really, really good at doing your surveys, doing those peanut butter tests. Uh, make it just second nature. Uh, that way you, that's going to, that's really the only way that you're going to really be able to, to detect. Right now, there aren't any fancy schmancy uh, detection uh, devices out there. Uh, the only thing we have is visual inspection and peanut butter lures. The, those lures are the most um, non-subjective way to test something because, you know, our eyesight isn't always the best. Sometimes it's really hard to see a little brown ant on um, a black, brown background. Uh, so our, we can fool ourselves and we are very uh, subjective. So doing the peanut butter stick testing is, uh, is key to is like the main tool you're gonna use for uh, prevention and interrupting these pathways. 
there's two things that you're trying to protect. You're trying to protect yourself and you're trying to protect other people, right? So if you, let's say you're not around the area, any of those areas that have a known detection, um, you still, you want to protect yourself because who knows what's been moved off of those areas, out of those areas um, before the ants were detected, right? So the ants can be floating around anywhere on island and you want to make sure that you don't accidentally infest yourself or your property. So whenever possible, you wanna do all your plant propagation, mulching, composting, uh, stuff like this in house. So try to minimize or avoid bringing things onto your property uh, as much as possible. Uh, this is pretty, this is a pretty common general farm practice uh, because this will also protect you against other plant pests, um, diseases, all kinds of stuff like that, right? It's not just about the little fire ants, um, but these techniques also work with little fire ants. Uh, if the, the ants are detected on your property, uh, make sure that you clearly mark out that area and you're not moving things from that area to uninfested areas, okay? Um, keeping all of that stuff. If you uh, generally move your slash over to a particular mulch pile, well, maybe start up a new mulch pile in that infested area so you don't accidentally move um, stuff over and, and continue to spread. Um, another example is don't move machinery. So if you use um, like mowers and uh, tractors and stuff like that where uh, debris and mud gets caked up in the nooks and crannies, um, don't be moving that stuff around and using it other places without going through a disinfestation um, or a cleaning process between between the two like infested and non-infested areas. Uh, if you are, if for whatever reason you do need to be bringing stuff onto your property, maybe it's some fill like base course kind of stuff. Maybe um, it's potting media or, um, or like soil and compost. Just maybe you don't have enough resources to be able to do all that stuff on your property. Well, set up a quarantine area where all of those things come and they can sit and you can monitor them before you move them around. Uh, if anything is detected, you can call the property people to come and help take, uh, to do more surveying and do treatments and, and such like that. When you protect, to protect other people, um, you need to be, this is more like if you are in the infested, within the infested area, you know that there is a chance that you have infested material. Um, you don't wanna be sharing this with other people, right? Um, and I think that's why we're here. We wanna know what we can do to reduce the risk, not only to ourselves, but also the risk of sharing to other people. Um, so being vigilant and staying aware during your harvest and post-harvest cleaning processes, um, you know, keeping an eye out for the ants when, when you're going through these, these, normal, uh, these normal things, these normal activities. Uh, and if you're in harvesting from an infested area, um, know what the risk level is for your particular crop and how much effort you're going to be having to put into the whole processing and post-harvest cleaning uh, in order to safely sell and share your commodities. Um, and those are the two big things that I'm going to focus on right now. Um, or three big things. Uh, so quarantine, this is your, the, the first level of defense. Um, you're, it's to contain and to treat and to monitor, right? So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have one area that you use every single time on your property that incoming materials get brought in and they're stored in that spot. Okay, it's not a different spot at each time, it's that same spot. Uh, and you want to do that anytime you bring stuff on your property. You also want to do that and quarantine things when you are, when you have um, potentially infested material going out. Okay, so this quarantine area is your high risk area. This is where you really want to be using um, a physical barrier as well as a chemical barrier 
Uh, I'm not sure, can you see my cursor here? Yeah, okay. Um, so in this picture, this is like a snapshot, just an aerial of some random um, properties actually in Moloa. Um, you see there's a lot of farmland everywhere, but there are a few nice big clear areas. This is the kind of spot that you want for a quarantine. You want it to be clear all the way around. That provides a physical barrier. Okay, you don't want to be bunching it up right against like um, shrubs or bushes or habitat. You want it to be clear and you want to have a nice sized uh, buffer between the perimeter of your quarantine area and the nearest habitat. Okay, so this is obviously this is a perfect area. This would be a, a good area also. It can be as large or as small as your general needs require. Um, just make sure that if you for you know occasionally have extra large needs that you find a suitable spot for those uh, uh, to quarantine a larger quantity of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, the point, uh, so once you um, set up your quarantine and you're using it on a regular um, basis, if for whatever reason, you do detect little fire ants in the materials that you brought in. Um, you want to follow these three R's, okay? You want to record what it was and where it came from, especially if it's something that you brought into your, uh, onto your farm, right? Um, that helps KISC and HDOA track and trace back to the source of that infestation, right? Um, and that could be somewhere completely different that we never, that nobody ever knew about. Um, you want to report this to Hawaii Department of Agriculture and Kauai Invasive Species Committee, um, because they're the ones that are going to be following up. They're the ones that are going to be doing all of the trace forward, trace backwards, um, everything to get to the root of the issue. And then you want to retain those items in the quarantine area and do not move them um, until you are given the all clear from Department of Ag or KISC. Um, and this includes items that, you know, any of the items that were in the quarantine area at the time of detection. So it doesn't necessarily matter if you found LFA in, say, if you had like 50 potted plants and only five of them tested positive, well, keep all 50 of those potted plants in there because it's possible you could have missed some. And all of those were sitting in your high risk area next to and near other infested materials. So it's a potential, um, it, they're potentially infested. Uh, allow, let KISC and HDOA do the treatments um, and do whatever they need to do um, to, and then they can give you the all clear or follow whatever other kind of procedures are necessary, depending on the situation. Uh, protecting yourself. Um, this is, these are the, the kind of main just takeaways, right? Um, again, going back to quarantine because it's, it's a big, big deal, uh, especially for farmers. Uh, you want to maintain a, a chemical, uh, residual chemical barrier around and throughout or throughout the, the quarantine area. This stuff is like, it's like Calstar, Bifen, Upstar, um, stuff like this. What it is, is it's, it's a pesticide that when you apply it and it dries, it binds to the surface that you applied it to. Uh, and insects crawling over that treated surface will die. This will help contain any potential introduction. So it doesn't get out and potentially spread throughout your property, right? That's a big, big issue. Um, you wanna make sure that your quarantine is able to contain any potential introduction. Um, and you, so make sure that you, you follow all the labeling instructions for whatever product that you use for the chemical barrier. Um, they all have uh, different, you know, different labels. So make sure you get one that's appropriate for your, uh, your situation.
Um, you want you don't want to move them. Like I also said, just leave them in place uh, and let HDOA or KISC uh, deal with them properly. Um, on site infestations, um, this is for those people who have um, the the infestation on their property, but it's not their entire property. Um, remember, keep all of your plant matter, everything within that infested area stays in that infested area and you don't move it out. Um, the only exception would be harvested crops and those crops I'll talk to you about for protecting other people, what, how you can uh, mitigate risks in that scenario. Um, again, uh, machinery, things like mowers, tractors, chippers, uh, stuff like that. Uh, make sure that you have a disinfestation procedure in place so that if you do use them within infested areas uh, and then you take them, you want to use them in a non-infested area that you don't accidentally move the ants with them, right? Um, make sure you can use a, like peanut butter stick surveys to test your machinery on a regular basis. Uh, usually before you want to take it out to go do uh, do work in uninfested areas. If you find little fire ants, um, just leave it in place. Don't move it for you know a few days. And you can use something uh, like amdrome probate, something like that to to treat um, the the machinery and around the where the machinery has been sitting, um, and then retest it a couple of days later to make sure you don't find any ants before using the machinery. Okay, um, protecting others. This goes into um, what someone, I believe someone was asking earlier about selling, um, selling crops at the market and if this can be a pathway for sharing little fire ants. Um, yes, it can. Uh, and Heather gave a great example of the pineapple earlier. Uh, the crop type and the physical features of the crops are going to carry different uh, potentials for, for risk, okay, um, the, the actual physical features. Uh, so even though we're going to, I'm breaking this down into tree crops and ground crops, okay. So we know that little fire ants, they nest everywhere, but they, and they really, really love to nest in trees, especially palm crowns, especially in epiphytes or behind moss, anywhere that they get that little bit of protection and it stays uh, nice and moist and cool. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the harvested crop is automatically going to be risky, right? Um, the different kinds of features. So if you have a smooth fruit, like an orange versus a hairy kind of fruit, like a rambutan, both of those are going to have a different risk associated with them. Um, things with husks like coconuts versus um, something without a husk, um, sapote or something like that, carry very different risks. Okay, also clustered, non-clustered fruit. Um, regardless of the risk that we talk about for each one of these kind of things, um, it's it's very important that the, the commodities are, the crop is inspected during, and you guys are staying vigilant throughout the post-harvest handling and treatment of these things. Uh, so, you know, keep your eye open, still inspect your fruit no matter what, still do like, especially with the washing and everything with your fruit, still, still do all of that kind of stuff. Um, and if you are a part of a buying, a buying cooperative, um, also keep your eyes open, uh, be, before you start handing everything out and have your own systems in place for risk reduction, because there could be something that even the most vigilant, uh, grower missed, right? You don't know that. And so having those, like a double inspection system, you know, pre-sale from the grower and post receiving from the buyer is a very good um, risk reduction system. Oops, here we go. Okay, uh, tree crops. 
smooth fruits. I call these simple fruits um, because there's a lot of smooth fruits out there with different types of features. Um, these are, they're smooth. They uh, don't have like the calyx kind of cap at the top. Um, these kind of things can be very easily inspected uh, and, and washed during post-harvest. Um, these are very low risk and I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, some of these types of trees on the Big Island are super, super high risk. Uh, so orange, like little fire ants absolutely love citrus because citrus trees has always has a ton of moss and epiphytes growing on them, especially older trees. Mango is, a, uh, is also a, a high risk kind of tree because they get really big. They're difficult to treat because of their size and they have the crackly bark that little fire ants like to be behind. Um, but the fruit themselves, I mean, you pick a, you pick some mangoes or you pick some star fruit or something. It's very easy to see any ants crawling on them. And then if you, uh, during, if you have a, a wash station with like a, a high, not a high power, but, um, like a hose, just even a general hose, you can normally knock off the ants. The ants are not likely to be nesting on this type of fruit, right? There's nowhere for them to nest or to hunker down and hide on. So that's why these are fairly low risk fruits. Um, other types of fruits, these may still be smooth, but maybe they're clustered or they're kind of hairy, sticky in some way. Maybe they have the calyx cap. These are moderate to high risk, okay? Stuff like bananas. Um, Elephae are notorious for nesting in bananas between the leaf axles, and they'll also nest in those clumps, okay? Anywhere that they can get a little bit of shelter. Uh, the mango steam. This is also something that people don't really think about, especially on, on the Big Island, because it looks like a very innocu innocuous fruit. It's nice and smooth, but underneath these little calyx here, you can have almost an entire colony with queens and brood and workers, okay? So making sure if you have something like this with this type of feature, you're looking under those calyx. Uh, rambutan, it's clustered fruit and they're kind of hairy. LFA will nest in within clusters, like tightly clusters. This goes for like jackfruit or similar types of fruits like this. Um, and then they, even though they are in, uh, they are nesting uh, in those clusters, they can also be difficult to dislodge because of the whole hairy nature of the fruits, okay? Um, it, it can be more difficult to disinfest. When you, if you have these types of fruits, you're gonna want to do like a post-harvest dip um, with agitation because just, you know, a simple dip is not going to dislodge the ants. Um, the, a dip needs to have some kind of a surfactant in there because LFA do float. Uh, okay, so um, if it doesn't have the surfactant, then it's not necessarily going to help dislodge the ants and they won't sink. Okay, so a dip can be, it can be um, an, a general insecticide that's labeled for post-harvest treatment of fruits. It could also be something uh, like a soapy water bath um, but make sure that you take extra caution. So if it's more on the hairy and tighter clusters, you're probably going to want to go with some kind of, a, you probably wouldn't want to, um, to rely on a soapy water bath, right? Uh, so be cautious on what you choose to do your post-harvest dips with. Um, now, fruits and nuts that have husks. These are some that this, I consider these a pretty high risk and you're gonna want to take extra, extra caution um, and take the extra steps if you're going to be uh, sharing or selling these type of commodities um, because of the associated risks. Uh, Heather already mentioned the coconuts. You know, the ants love to nest in coconuts uh, up in the up in the in the crowns, and then once they're harvested, 
they're always gonna, there's almost always some kind of nooks and crannies or cracks in the outer husk. Those ants will get all the way into that fibrous husk. And that is almost impossible to disinfest. The only real way to do that is to take off and remove the husk in order to share or sell clean commodities. Um, the same thing with, uh, with mac nuts. If there is a little puka in, um, in the shell, the ants will get into the shell, into the nuts. Uh, so keep all, this is a high risk coffee. I know that Kauai recently, um, fairly recently detected coffee berry borer um, on island. Uh, and they make those little pukas right in, in the, the belly button and the pico of the, the cherry. Well, LFA go into those, uh, those pukas and they go and they can go into the galleries. Um, they have been shown to, uh, to nest in abandoned galleries of uh, coffee berry borer and other types of uh, gall forming insects. So this is also um, a big risk. Um, be very extra, extra cautious if any of this is, applies to you, if these commodities or these situations apply to you. Uh, ground crops, just like um, tree crops, it, the physical features of the ground crops do carry different risks associated with them. Um, normally, a lot of the ground crops that um, people grow in Hawaii are, you know, there, there's more, high, there's high turnover, um, there's crop rotations, stuff like this. So uh, we haven't seen a huge issue with little fire ants in um, like commercial ground cropping. Um, that said, there are, you know, LFA, you know, something like pineapple that isn't rotated. That's a super high, that's a high risk commodity. Um, ginger, just the general structure of the ginger foliage and the stalks with all of those leaf axles, the LFA do like to nest in there. Uh, we have seen uh, little fire ants nesting in Kahlo, uh, in the low E in um, Waipio. Usually it's more along the banks, but they have been in the actual leaf axles of the Kahlo themselves. So don't think that just because if it's growing in, in a low E that it's going to be, that's not going to be at risk for little fire ants. Be very vigilant about this kind of stuff. Um, so the different kinds of, so the root crops, even though you pull them up, the actual crop themselves may not be an issue uh, because you're pulling it out of the ground. So this is like sweet potato, um, the, the taro corm, uh, ginger, even turmeric, you know, stuff like this. You guys are pulling up the actual crop and then you're cutting off the greens. You're washing your crops. This is all pretty low risk because the ants are not necessarily in that stuff, right? They're not below ground. They're in the foliage, they're in the duff of the, um, the, the top layer, duff of the soil, um, stuff like that. So that's pretty low risk. But what you really want to be aware of is the risk associated with the leftover materials. So the, the ginger stalks that are left over after harvest, the, uh, the huli that you're going to be replanting um, in, in the taro fields. Uh, make sure that that stuff gets treated appropriately, whether you're gonna be composting it or whether you're gonna be replanting it because you don't want to keep propagating and perpetuating uh, the infestation. Ground crops such as pineapple, like we already mentioned, this is high risk, not only because the plants themselves are perfectly designed to harbor the ants, um, but also the tops of the pineapples themselves is where the ants really love to, to hide especially underneath the, where the top connects to the actual fruit. Um, you, 
if you are a pineapple grower and you are sharing and selling these, um, be extra cautious when during your inspection um, and during harvest, everything and post-harvest treatment. Uh, really carefully inspect all of the leaf axles of the crowns uh, and underneath the crown. Uh, also make sure to do a, a post-harvest strip with agitation or post-harvest dip with agitation. Uh, agitation is key, especially having and also having a, a surfactant in there because the, the water is very difficult. It's difficult to get the water all the way down to where the actual leaves meet. Um, there's a lot of times if with just regular water, there's gonna be a little air bubble, air gap between in the, in the base of the leaf axle. And that's can that can make it so the ants avoid treatment. So make sure there's a surfactant in there, make sure you agitate uh, in order to get the, the treatment all the way and sufficiently treat the, the pineapple, especially the crowns. Um, and I think this is pretty much, I think this is one of the last slides or maybe second to last. Um, that's all based on um, human transportation, like because we are the main pathway, right? We're the ones that share it. We're the ones that spread it. Um, but this is also, it's also really important for everyone to understand that these can spread naturally. Um, I touched on it at the beginning and this is just kind of to really set that in place. Um, I don't know where all of you guys are on island. If you guys uh, are have been affected by any of the flooding that has gone on the last uh, few years on Kauai, uh, this is, flooding is a major way that little fire ants can spread and disperse from an infested area. So if an infested area gets subjected to flooding, those ants that are on, maybe it was just one property, well, those ants can float and they go everywhere that that water goes. And now, even though it was one property, maybe 50 colonies have now just been dispersed onto 50 different properties, and it may take a few years before it, those uh, individual infestations grow to the point where you can, where you notice them, okay? This is where those surveys, your surveys come in. Uh, you know, especially after a flood, uh, you're gonna want to make sure to do at a minimum of an annual survey just kind of perpetually um, to make, uh, this will help with early detection and to, uh, to mitigate the risk of you getting stuck in a situation where your whole property is infested. Um, same thing with, uh, with tall trees and wind. If there's a big storm that has come through and just, it could potentially blow the ants uh, around and you could potentially get uh, aerial introduction. The ants don't fly, but they're so tiny and so light that they'll get picked up by a strong wind in a heartbeat and who knows how far it can get dispersed. Uh, we, that's never really been assessed, um, but we do know that there are insects floating around in, in the sky all the time. Um, and so don't, don't be complacent. Uh, just the recap, I know I've reiterated and reiterated, but this one more time, third time's the charm. LFA are awful. Everybody hates them. Nobody wants them. Uh, they, they are moved mostly by people. We are the major, major source of moving them around, but sometimes they can be dispersed naturally. And we need to stay vigilant. We cannot be complacent. We cannot be apathetic to this if we expect to lit to maintain our our ant free lifestyle. Okay, we can't be letting the guard, our guards down. So we have to put the effort into prevention. Um, it's hard. I understand that it's really difficult to see the value and the the return for those efforts because you don't have little fire ants. Um, and 
oftentimes those benefits are, it's like the hindsight is 2020. You only realize the benefit of um, what you could have, uh, you could have gained uh, after you're already invested in being impacted. But I would rather you guys do the, the effort and never have to realize the, the true value of the prevention because you got infested. I'd rather you just never get infested and never have to deal with these guys. Um, and so I guess just take our word for it that prevention is the key. So just stay vigilant and hopefully just keep up the good work. Yep, and we'll take questions after the whole thing. Yes, sure. Thank you, Michelle. That's a great information information for the growers especially. And so I will try one more time my polling. Michelle? Yes. Uh, can you stop sharing? I think that, that will make maybe a little bit, little bit of a difference, yeah? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I can try. <laughs> stop. There. Yes. So let me try one more time. No, I cannot. Hi. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Can you see it? Okay, I think it's it's yes. working. It's working. So it will stay for one minute. Please participate. Um, Roshan, yes. This is Carolyn from Kauai, uh -huh. and um, my only question—I just did the survey—is okay. I know they did a promotion in the schools with those peanut butter kits. Are they mm -hmm. going to continue doing that? So I think uh, uh, Tiffany will answer this question in the in the next next presentation. <laughs> okay, because okay. yes. I'm going to probably yeah. log off yeah. in a little while. Thank you. Okay, You're welcome. But we will have a recording if you you miss anything in this session. So I think I will end my poll and I thank everyone for participating in this poll and, and thank you. So, and so we have a last presentation from Tiffany. Tiffany will be talking on the uh, available committee resources. Tiffany, yes, please. Great, can you guys see the full presentation on the side yes. notes? Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for coming to the presentations. Um, I'm gonna do a really short overview of the resources available for the Kauai community. A lot of this was covered in previous presentations. Let's see if I can move it. There we go. Um, I first wanna review the goal for Kauai or for Little Fire Ants on Kauai. We still have the goal to eliminate or eradicate. Yes, I'm gonna use that word. We generally don't like to use that word invasive species, but I'm going to use it because our goal is still to eradicate all little fire ants from Kauai. And eradication is possible because if we follow how the infestation currently is on Kauai, 
When an invasive pest or species is introduced to the island, the population stays relatively low in low numbers in scattered locations across the island. If it's left unchecked, the population will grow exponentially. It'll become widespread and it'll reach a point where island-wide eradication is no longer possible. Um, and at this point, that's when the management of this pest is left to the individual landowners, the farmers, the growers. Um, but the good news on Kauai is that LFA is still localized and island-wide eradication can be possible if we know where it's at. Even with the discovery of additional little fire ant detections on islands, in addition to the ones that we've covered today, if we get more, populations will still be scattered locations and can be controlled. It's very important to note that. Um, we can reach this goal if we find them early. This has been reiterated in, and I'm gonna reiterate it again. Um, as seen in the previous presentations today, little fire ants are able to spread between islands, across landowner boundaries, and overlap jurisdictions. LFA can still um, can stay under the radar unnoticed for years, but we are able to detect them with our peanut butter surveys. H2A and KISS teams complete annual island-wide surveys um, for little fire ants at high-risk sites. We survey the airport, the harbors, greenway stations, and nurseries. If a population is detected, as it's been this year, the rapid response treatment strategies are deployed. Um, for successful eradication, the continued treatment at regular intervals is required. Craig did kind of, um, cover this in the first presentation. We monitor the site for um, we monitor the site with surveys for years um, to ensure that all LFA are eliminated and the entire infestation is controlled. This is how we can reach eradication. Um, so to reach the goal of Kauai to be LFA free and protect Kauai's agriculture, it takes a multi-agency rapid response partnership effort that includes the Kauai community. This will answer your question, Carolyn, um, and another question that was commented earlier. So we have work with one example is that we work with Pono endorsed nurseries and landscapers on the island to practice best management practices. And this includes surveying and inspecting incoming materials to the nurseries, as well as some of the landscapers do survey their trees and other areas of their clients. Um, they also participate in annual LFA surveys. It also has the Kauai community can help detect little fire ant by completing home surveys every year during Stop the Ant Month. That's October, we're in the month right now. Um, we do have students participate in citizen science projects across the island and they survey their yards. Most recently we participated with or partnered with the Kauai County Farm Bureau, Malama Kauai, the County of Kauai Sunshine Markets to distribute these larger test kits to Kauai farmers, which some of you probably received that are here today. Can, we know that community collaboration works. On Oahu, 10 additional LFA sites are now undergoing treatment that were identified and reported from these community LFA samplings. It works. We should do this across the island. Um, some of the free services that we offer here on Kauai for LFA include the ant collection or survey kits that you hear about. These kits can be picked up at your local library at the Kauai Invasive Species Office in Mailua, or by direct mail through stoptheant.org. If you go to that website, you can request this kit to be mailed directly to you. The kits have all the necessary materials that you need to survey your property or crops. There's larger kits for the crops and smaller kits for homeowners. Um, if you need additional materials, contact KISS. We'll provide them for you. Additionally, we'll provide LFA identification for sampling for the samples that were submitted. Samples can be dropped off or mailed. Um, KISS can also arrange to pick up samples directly from the farmers in larger properties. So KISS submits the samples to H2A for confirmation of a positive little fire ant ID. Only the person that submitted the samples will be informed of the results. We keep all LFA infestation um, locations and homeowners or property owners confidential. If LFA are confirmed, we're here to help you. Our only focus is to locate and eliminate the species before it can further spread on the island and eradication becomes impossible. We will provide the treatment free um, if it's confirmed on your property. This group um, also provides additional information, workshops, and follow-up as needed. I should step back to say when I use the word we, it's a collective we. It's with everybody that you've listened to talk to today, Hawaii Department of Agriculture, Hawaii Invasive Species Committee, UHC TAR and Hawaii Ant Lab. Um, all of us are involved in that. 
Um, as we've heard multiple times, surveying and identifying the ants on your property is the number one action you can take to protect your farm or property. If LFA are confirmed, effective treatment can begin. We can. Um, we already had successful elimination of LFA on the two of the previous populations as Craig has stated in the first presentation. Once you've confirmed that your property is LFA free, you should test all incoming materials to your farm to prevent the introduction. Um, Michelle covered this in her last presentation. So how to survey, you wanna test your property at least once a year, preferably more, but at least once a year, and then submit the samples that are collected for identification. Um, as Heather pointed out, there's 60 different ant species on the islands. It's hard to identify. We have to look underneath a microscope to positively identify it for little fire ants. Submit the samples so we can tell you what kind of ants you have. Um, always check new plant materials coming into the, your area. Check cargo from infested areas. Check your gear from visiting infested areas. We know this works. Nurseries um, on island have test shipments coming from off island to verify that there are no LFA in any of the plant materials. Well, LFA have been detected this way in these early detection surveys that they do. And we were able to stop it before it became spread on Kauai. We know this works. How do you survey? This was covered, I'm gonna go over it one more time. You wanna smear a thin layer of peanut butter on the edge of the chopsticks that are provided. Um, if it's too thick, it becomes difficult for us to identify the ants because they get smushed in the peanut butter. So you wanna make it a really thin layer of peanut butter. Then you're gonna place these sticks in shaded areas on the border of your property and in hot spots. Leave them there for about 30 minutes to an hour. You wanna place along the border, you can go about every 10 feet along the perimeter of your property. Some of the hot spots, these have been included um, in previous presentations, so I'll just review it. Trees, compost piles, rocks or rock walls, weed mat, plastic, debris on your property, any pots on your property, um, really any shady moist area that a colony can be. Once um, after an hour has gone by, go ahead and pick up the sticks. I'm saying carefully place them in the plastic bag. One is they can fall off the stick and you wanna make sure you're collecting the ants that you surveyed for. And then also if they are fire ants, they can bite you. So carefully put them in the bag and place them in the freezer for about 24 hours. This will kill the ants. Um, then you can submit your, your dead ant samples for identification again. All the results are kept confidential. You can submit them at Kauai Invasive Species Committee. Our um, office is up above Wailua Homesteads or the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Um, Hawaii, Kauai Invasive Species Committee, you can call us if you need them to be picked up. If you have um, a lot of community farm groups can call us and we can collect multiple samples at once to make it easier. All of this information is on our website as well as stoptheant.org's website and Hawaii Ant Lab's website. Again, surveying and identifying the ants on your property is the number one action that you can take to protect your farm and your property and your business. Once you confirm your property is LFA free, this is when you should be taking in those risk um, reduction practices that Michelle talked about and test all incoming materials, have the quarantine area. And this is gonna help prevent the introduction to your LFA free property. If LFA are detected, um, we're here to help you, it's okay. Again, we're just trying to eradicate it from the island. We will help you in any way that we can. All positive lo um, detection locations and property owners are kept confidential. H2A and KISS teams will work with you to survey the area that you detected it, as well as surrounding areas to determine the size of the infestation. A site-specific treatment plan will be developed in partnership with all of the experts that you met here today. Um, treatment takes time. And during this time, we can work with you to develop best management practices that fit into your operations and mitigate the risk of spread, um, unintended spread to others. We will conduct monitoring surveys at the site post-treatment to ensure that the treatment was successful and all LFA were eliminated, sorry. Again, this is because we have the goal of eradication of LFA on Kauai. We wanna be LFA free Kauai and we can work together towards this goal. Um, I just did a quick overview of everything that was discussed today. And this is the last slide I have and it's all the contact information of everybody that you heard from. These are a lot of great resources. 
I'm going to keep this up for a couple minutes. Um, I know we're going to move into question answers. I'm going to leave this up. We will be sending this out as well. Um, Roshan did mention that we're recording this. We're recording it. It'll be posted on our uh, Kauai Invasive Species Committee's YouTube channel. The additional information that Michelle talked about and I believe Heather talked about in the chat boxes will be provided to participants and we will make that available on our website. Okay, Thank great. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. So we have now my favorite part, question and answer. So the floor is open for question and answer. I think uh, I will just go through the chat box if there is anything in, uh, that needs to be addressed. So I have a uh, one, one I, I, I haven't got that clear. Is the blindness for animal is permanent? Um, yes. Yeah. This is permanent? Okay. It, it is. Uh -huh. um, I think, I, I, I don't think there's been a whole lot of research on it, mm -hmm. um, but what it seems like there, maybe if it was like early and there's only been, you know, one or two um, stings that the that's may have some kind some kind of like eye drops that could relieve some of the symptoms but this stuff the clouding of the cornea uh, is um, compounded over time and so if an animal is in an infested area they're constantly getting ants in the eyeballs and getting stung and it every sting leads to a little more of the clouding and a little more of the clouding and a little more um, and so ultimately the bigger picture is it's they're they're permanently they're the, those clouds are permanently there. So that means that is a multiple stung yeah. in the eye. Okay. So I have a little bit of stupid question. Why a little fire and bites or sting? Why do they sting? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because they're because freaking out. Oh. They're 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 just in complete freak out mode because um, because there is a lots of ants yeah lots of ants only few species of ants bite little fire and tropical uh, fire, fire ant and and only few is that the, their mouth parts being like a um they're actually stinging they do have a stinger uh, mm -hmm. and so what you guys are feeling is an actual sting um, when they're stinging us or when they're stinging animals. Um, that's their self-defense mode. Uh, and so it's because they get caught in our clothes um, or in the case of uh, animals in the eyes, you can't be wiping them away. So they're stuck there and you're blinking and they're freaking mm -hmm. out. And that's our defense mechanism. So okay. that's why they sting. They're not seeking you out mm -hmm. to sting that you. Means, that means they are not <laughs> blood feeder. That's yeah. they are not I mean, blood feeder. So one they're, more. they're not blood feeders, and okay. so <laughs> insect repellent doesn't do anything because they're so, not attracted to you. <laughs> so uh, on on peanut butter, so is peanut butter is lure or they are protein feeder or what is the? Um, they're a lipid responding ant. Mm -hmm. um, that's the simplest way I can put it. So when you're putting out bait or you're to control mm -hmm. them or you're putting out a lure to detect them. You want something that's high fat, um, mm -hmm. and I think I should leave it there so we don't don't get all confused with the whole diet stuff. Mm -hmm. That's another okay. mess <laughs> in itself. Uh, I'm going through going through the chat box again. I, I stopped at the one question. So TSA does in, does inspect for the little fire ant. Yeah, they look for the permit from Department of Ag. Is that right? So when we move plant materials or soil or something related to plants, we take to other island, TSA will look for the permit from Department of Ag. Is that right? Um, there is a conversation in a chat box. No, huh? um, TSA is specifically for, I think for uh, like passenger flights. It's not, I don't think that they're dealing with air cargo so much. Um, and I think it's more of there, there are, there are different agencies that have jurisdictions for different kind of imports, exports, right? Um, HDOA, it has jurisdiction over agriculture products. 
only mm -hmm. um, going inter-island, so within the state of Hawaii only. Um, this is propagated material. I think it's mm -hmm. also what planting, um, what soil or planting media, stuff like that, uh, not necessarily anything else. Uh, so, you know, some things can be higher risk than others, and they only have jurisdiction over that. Uh, if somebody shipped a vehicle from the big island to another island, nobody seems to have jurisdiction over inspecting those types of things. Um, so that's a, a gap in our in our local biosecurity system. Um, now, if we're talking interstate going to the mainland, uh, between Hawaii and the mainland, um, that's USDA. They have jurisdiction over agriculture stuff going uh, between uh, the states. Um, and then if we go international, that's Department of Defense. They're responsible for uh, making sure that biosecurity but internationally is, uh, is upheld. Uh, but they have, they're looking for terrorists also. <laughs> so, you know, they, they might have better, bigger fish to fry and may not see the value in biosecurity that other people do. Um, and so, you know, the whole shipping and regulatory stuff uh, is, is a very complex web. Thank you. I stopped at another chat, uh, chat, chat, chat information. It says, so it's about the colony of a little fire and the colony. So little fire and colony can be in the macadamia nut or in the leaf axil. So there is a, there is, so one colony means how much area it will spread. One colony means only one macadamia nut. It reside into one macadamia nut. Is that um, correct? One, one nest. So yeah, one nest. Um, one, one nest. yeah. So one nest can fit in a magnet shell, right? Mm -hmm. One nest can fit in a leaf axle. Um, but let's say you have a pineapple top, and mm -hmm. each one of those leaf axles has a separate nest. Mm -hmm. Well, now that whole pineapple top we kind of refer to as a colony, colony, because each one of those nests work together, right? And mm -hmm. So a quote colony can be as big or as small as there's habitat. Um, and this is what we call a, a super colony because each one of those individual nests cooperate together uh, and work as a larger system, as a larger thing. Um, it's not like each one of those nests are competing with each other. They're all working together. So each nest, or this nest has a queen, multiple queens. Each nest has multiple queens. Queen. And they have a workers and soldier, yeah? Um, they have workers and they have brood. So Broods. eggs, larva, pupa, mm -hmm. um, and they have multiple queens. Sometimes they have males. So spreading occurs when the queen moves, not the workers and the broods. Is that right? Say that again. Spreading of little fire ants means the queen is moving from one place to another, not workers. You do, you do need to transport a, a queen. Um, it's possible that the brood can raise uh, a queen uh, or that ants without a queen could raise a queen from the brood if it was workers and brood, but that hasn't necessarily been documented. Uh, the, the reproduction is crazy. Uh, everything about these guys is crazy. Mm -hmm, yeah. Like they they don't do anything simple. Mm -hmm. Is basically the, the gist of of this story. Yeah. So, uh, the, the infestation will occur from a, like a one one nest or one colony. Yes. But now we have thirteen acres of agricultural land infested. Means mm -hmm. millions of millions of colonies. Is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, these, means... they can they can have you can have two hundred million ants per acre. Mm -hmm. So that means two hundred this... million ants per acre. That's a lot yeah. of ants. Yes, millions um, of colonies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you think about if 
uh, to put this in perspective, um, it's it's suspected that the infestate the the issue on in Hawaii in general um, is suspected of being started by a single a single introduction. So uh, a single queen and male introduction, um, and they can know that because of this clonal reproduction system that all of the queens are genetically identical, all the males are genetically identical, and all the workers are genetically identical. Um, and we can trace that back to other in populations around the world. Um, so when we know that ours, our infestation came from Florida, we don't know how or when exactly it got here. Um, we have suspicions, but we don't know exactly when. And it's suspected that it was one single colony that got brought here and then it's expanded from there. And now almost the entire big island, uh, there are more infested areas and non-infested areas here on the big island. And unfortunately it's been shared to other islands as well. Thank you. So, so that means this infestation might be old, yeah? It, it, it occurred maybe some somewhere two years ago, maybe. Is who that, knows? Yeah, yeah okay. who knows? Mm -hmm. So I had a, I have my question. So the first infestation of LFA was back in 1999 in, in Kalihiwai, Kalihiwai, maybe uh, I, this, this might be a question for Craig also, Kalihiwai and at Sage, it reappeared in 2001, yeah? So that means the, the whatever done treatment done in 2019, uh, 1999 eradication is not enough or they escaped from that uh, eradication program? Just a curious, yeah. Undetectable levels, huh? Just um, hard to detect the ants, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, by by using the uh, by baiting, mm -hmm. you cannot get always get all because like uh -huh. you know there's so many ants in one you know in one square feet that we have to like if you if you wanted to catch all the ants. Every square feet, you gotta put on uh, peanut butter stick, you know, on bait in order to catch them. Because if we do it 10 feet apart, but you might miss in the middle, you know, the 10 feet, yeah. It's like, um, correct me, um, Michelle, they, um, they forage, but maybe depends, yeah, like three feet out from the nest, the queen, or you know, Nobody they, knows. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, nobody knows. And that can be depend on a lot of different factors, like the size of the population and how much resources yeah. are available to them. Um, what we do know is it's really difficult to detect those last remaining remnant colonies. And this is typical of invasive species in general, even plants and Tiffany knows all about that, um, that trying to get those last couple plants out there yeah. in the field is is really really difficult uh, it's difficult to spot um it's difficult to control same thing with the ants uh, you can knock them down to below detectable levels but you don't know if they're really gone or if you just haven't been able to detect them um, and this is why it's important for eradication projects to commit long term for and commit to however long it takes to get a minimum of three years without detections before you even consider uh -huh. um, saying the, the big E word. Um, and the, one of the big issues with the original eradication effort back in like 99 and 2000 was at the time, there wasn't a whole lot known about this species. I mean, it's, it's so strange because it's been known around the world for since for a hundred years now um and it's known to have this potential of being devastating but there wasn't a lot of research put in to uh, the behavior biology and control methods and so they didn't have those tools available at the at the time for um, proper treatment um, of the trees and the ground or detection methods. Even now, our detection methods are pretty rudimentary. Uh, we have to rely on peanut butter lures and the accuracy of a survey is gonna be dependent on 
spacing, you know, but we can't expect um, everybody to go out and put a stick every foot throughout, you know, 12 acres. I mean, Craig did do every three <laughs> feet a few years ago, overachiever, <laughs> Craig and Kauai Invasive Species Committee. And that was an incredible survey effort, like over 19, like what, over 15,000 survey samples put out. And that gave excellent coverage. So we know those results are very accurate, but that's not realistic for every, every survey effort. So you have to, for these, these kind of um, detection efforts, you have to have a compromise between accuracy and um, practicality. And then we try to improve um, our confidence by doing re repetition over time. Um, and that's one of the places that, um, one of the areas that was lacking in the original uh, eradication. It was declared eradicated after, what was it, Craig, even within a year after or less than a year after treatment, and there wasn't follow-up for a few years um, when KISC went back uh, and realized that it hadn't been eradicated, and so it rebounded and it spread, um, and we just took our time to be able to develop the methods needed to be able to do it um, properly. And we gave it a big old round to go. Yes. Okay, thank you. So there is a couple of interesting questions in the chat box um, asking about the spread of colony. Uh, it's a rate of spread of colony, you know, maybe I, it, it's, it's difficult to answer, I know, but it's asking, is there anything X yards in the X period of time, if there is a colony already established Maybe it needs some kind of study, yeah. But do you uh, have do you have any idea? It will spread in this fashion, like a. So they because they um, work together um, so easily. Uh, they, you know, the rate of spread at the beginning of a, an infestation is going to be different than the rate of spread five years down the line, right? Um, they can support very high population densities within an area. So at first the outward spread is going to be pretty slow, maybe, uh, you know, 10 meters a year, maybe, um, because they're building up their population and they're in that area and they're taking advantage of all the nearby nesting sites. Once it hits a critical like threshold, then you get these explosions, population explosions, and then it can start spreading uh, potentially at 50 you know, even up 50 meters a year um, at, at that point. So uh, nobody has really looked at that kind of a, di a di dynamic. They just kind of um, look at existing uh, infestations around the world and say, okay, well, it started here in this year and now it's spread in this big of an area. So we're going to say it has a rate of spread of you know, 50 meters a year, but uh, you know, it's, you get different numbers from different mm -hmm. studies. It depends, yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, another question, uh, if a farmer has a confirmed case of LFA, are they able to safely and responsible for, for getting their produce in the market using methods that, that you discussed? Is that uh, yeah, okay? Yeah, okay. I think you can, mm -hmm. um, but you do have to take into account the actual product that you're trying to take to market and put the appropriate effort into inspection and post-harvest handling of those uh, of that product for whatever it is you know so if it's the low moderate or high risk things it carries different effort levels right um, if you have a high risk product you need to be putting in that over the top extra effort of like say dehusking the coconuts, um, dehusking or cracking your mac nuts, um, you know, with the coffee processing, whatever it is, um, if you want to provide a clean, safe product to the buyers. Um, yeah, you're just gonna have to do the appropriate efforts for whatever it is. 
Thank this you. is Heather. Can I just add on a, a few points just about yes, some sure. of the questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to point out that the little fire ants are really a Pacific Island problem. So that might be where um, some of these questions, there just isn't the research done yet. Uh, Michelle has a large task of having to really know everything about the little fire ants uh, because there really aren't labs like ours dealing with this particular species. Um, also, as far as the question with um, can farmers sell their, their products safely, look at Big Island, for example. Um, we have to <clears throat> exist in a land that is infested with little fire ants. For example, there's a county mulch facility where people drop off their infested green waste and it gets treated and heated and then people are able to take a uh, pest-free stock so there are ways to do it but like michelle said depending on what it is it could be more easily said than done and i did notice there's one more question um above the the chat that we were uh, looking at are the queens winged if so uh, do they fly <laughs> So I should have touched on this in the biology portion, but uh, the queens have wings, but I like to call them the uh, penguins of the ants because we're not observing them flying. So uh, don't fear that they're going to fly to a neighborhood near you. With other ant species, the queen and the male both have wings and they have a nuptial flight. The queen sheds her wings and then the male goes off to die. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Okay, that was it. thank you. Thank you, Heather. So there is a last question. Um, oh. Okay, it's answered in the chat box. So I have a question. So if we have a um, positive confirmed sites of LFA, Suppose it's in the, now it's in the Moloa. What we need to do in the rest of the sites in the island, rest of the, whatever area in the island. So are we, is that, does that make sense? So we have a Moloa positive. Now, are we gonna survey in the other sites regularly? That, I think, uh, Tiffany. Mm -hmm. Are you? Is um, other, well, there is a survey the other in, uh, two sites? Are you talking about the other no, two no, sites? No, no, other little sites, fire ants? like, a, like a oh. Louis, Koloa, or wherever. Yes, yeah, so um, KISC and HDOA do island-wide surveys at all the greenway stations, nurseries, the ports of entry. But as Michelle and others talked about, there's multiple pathways for little fire ants to get here. We're not surveying every container that comes in. HDOA is not even doing, we can't do that doesn't, we don't have the resources in Hawaii or the legislation. Um, so we, we rely on the public to survey their individual areas to find these additional infestations. Um, that's really how they found more populations on Oahu. Like I said, I, I believe 10 of their ex, 10 of them since 2017 were reported from public surveys. It's really important, like Michelle said, successful eradications rely on public support, cooperation, and reporting. If that doesn't happen, we are not going to be able to eradicate it, and this will be left to the landowners. Um, it'll be their responsibility to control it on their pro own property. Right now, we can offer the services of controlling it because it's in a limited number. So we do survey, we do early detection surveys as much as we can, but again, KISC and H2A are small teams. We can't be everywhere on the island and survey the entire island. There's a couple of other, um, our nurseries that are Pono and Durst do survey the areas. And again, we're asking all the farmers to survey. I think, uh, uh, did you test upon the question from uh, Kathy Lump, uh, the, the survey in the school? Yes, so during Little mm -hmm. Fire Ant um, Awareness Month or Stop the Ant Month, which is October, we go to a lot of schools and visit them. Um, and the classroom goes out and surveys. The students go and survey their own areas at home, bring in the Little Fire Ants, and we go through a whole identification with them. If anything does come up 
suspect for a little fire ant, we turn that into H2A. Most of the time, they're not a suspect little fire ant, they're little black fire ant or little black ants or yellow crazy ants. Um, but that is one way to get out there and the students have a really fun time doing it. They get to look at the ants under a microscope and try to identify it. There's a few more questions in the chat box. It's a, I don't know, okay. Um, I can do, I can answer both of these. Um, for, for Randy, um, I just sent the, uh, my response in the chat box as well. Um, I don't know what the temperature, the maximum temperature range is for the little fire ants. If you wanted to do a heat treatment as like a post harvest or a, just a phytosanitation kind of thing. Um, Arnold Hara, Dr. Hara with CTAR did do a hot water drench study of uh, uh, quite a number of years ago. And um, the study is, could be, is usually usually found on like Google Scholar. So if you did a Google Scholar search for like a little fire ants and um, Arnold Hara or something like that, then you should be able to pull that up. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to get my contact. Any one of you guys is welcome to get my contact from Roshan and shoot me an email if you have specific quest, quest specific questions or would like um, like research papers because we have a huge database of research from around the world on little fire ants and I've read every single one of those papers mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I can pull that up and send you a copy real quick so um, there's that and the other one how many similar sized ants are are known to reside on the island. Um, I can, I can tell you that there are at least three species that can look identical to little fire ants from the naked eye. That it's even, it can even be difficult for for us who work with these things all the time to be able to identify them in the field. So we don't ever just pull identifications in the field. What we do is we say, well, this is definitely not little fire ants and this is a suspect. And then we take them back to the lab to identify them for sure. So I can, yeah, there's at least three that look identical. Um, there's probably um, six to eight that a lay person could potentially confuse with, with little fire ants, so. There's, there's that. Yellow little uh, that one. Okay, thank you. So I have another question, just one. <laughs> so you mentioned about buffer, buffer area, yeah? Buffer, buffer area, area in yeah. the farms or garden or in the, in the property. Yeah, so especially for like you, quarantine areas. Did yeah. you recommend, recommend it to spray in the buffer area? Um, you you can yeah. if mm -hmm. you want, but it's not, I mean, you want whatever, when you spray the residual pesticide, you want it to completely in, uh, enclose your, um, your quarantine area and maybe out a little, provide a, like a, a border around, right? So nothing can overhang the chemical barrier, but you don't have to go so far as to spray you know, a 50 foot wide swath all the way around around it. Um, that's pretty overkill. Um, just use what you need. If you did like a, maybe a two or three foot swath all the way around, um, that is more than sufficient to for containment. Um, yeah, and as long as you, I would suggest have a minimum of 10 to 20 foot buffer between your uh, your quarantine area and the nearest habitat. Whatever that habitat is, whether it's vegetation, whether it's a garbage pile, whether it's um, a barn or your, your stacks of pots, um, whatever that habitat is, um, make sure that there's at least 10 to 20 feet buffer between a quarantine and that area. Thank you. So any other questions? For Thanks. Michelle, Heather, Tiffany, I, I, yeah, and I Frank. Got some, I got yes, some questions. Mm -hmm. so I will add that I think 130 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes is usually for like shipping, pre shipping treatment for like the Rapid Ohia death, for instance. 
That's what they suggest. And you have to get that to the insect um, mm -hmm. for the full time, which can be difficult in some commodities. But uh, my question was, who does the ant identifications at KISC and at HDLA on Kauai? I mean, how many staff do you have that are capable of doing that? Um, at KISC, or Kauai Invasive Species Committee, we have three staff members that are trained to do a quick sort, and they do a quick sort, and then any suspect ones are submitted to HDOA for proper confirmation and identification. Almost, it's enough. And, and then as, as a follow-up, for the identifications, is it identified to species or genus or just LFA or not LFA? Um, that depends on the year and how many resources we have available. I think that's kind of the case across all of the islands. Um, of course, we would love for it to be identified by species every single time we have a species, an ant sample submitted. That's not always the case. Um, I do believe we'll be working with some of the farmers here when they submit their ant species samples that we would like to try to get it as close as possible to species or genus so we can help them mitigate whatever impacts those particular ants have on property. But we likely will not do that for every single residential um, ant that's submitted because that's a lot of work for the Department of Agriculture and Hawaii Ant Lab to do. Yeah, I know on Maui, we um, as the volume of ant specimens increases over time. Um, you know, we, depending on staffing, it, you know, those are sorts of questions we're struggling with right now. And then as a follow, as kind of one last question I had was, on the big island for farmers, where this is widespread, what sort of resources can they expect? Is it you, like BISC and how and h 2 they won't come treat, will they? Or they would just provide information if things get too widespread on Kauai? Um, yeah, Heather, do you want to look at this? Yeah, so with the situation on Big Island where we are not able to go out and treat for every person, uh, we have a farmer's program and we go out to do site visits where we teach them more extensively about um, biology, uh, prevention, uh, management which includes all the treatment information we take a large kit out teach them how to survey uh, their larger parcels and do mixing and application demos with a blank uh, bait mm -hmm. really just a lot of hand folding up front um, and then we also check in with them at the six month and one year point all right well i just want to thank you all Kauai is fortunate to have such a great team working on this and, uh, and the community seems like they're into it. And uh, you know, best of luck. We wish here that on Maui where we are that we uh, didn't have as many ants <laughs> as we do. And- uh, They're still not everywhere. Yeah, I wish you best of luck in your effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Thank can you I ask, uh, answer a question from Jillian? Um, she mm -hmm. did ask if uh, there was any known natural methods to manage and destroy the, um, the habitats and colonies. Um, so it depends on what you mean by natural. Uh, when it comes to like habitat and stuff, habitat modification is a, a very good way to help augment any kind of treatments. So for example, if you have like a dense jungly area that you can't access, you can't walk through, but you know it's completely effect, uh, infested, um, habitat modification may be going in with a giant shredder if you had if you had access to one and just shredding that stuff, all of that plant material down to the ground to being a um, like a mulch layer that you can now walk through the area and treat the ground and whatever ants that are now down on the ground. Um, that's been done uh, on Oahu. There's a big ranch on Oahu that we've been working with and they did that for parts of their infestation and it's very effective. Um, so when it comes to, if you guys were doing it yourselves, we could come up with a lot of different options. Um, right now we're, we're leaving it to um, HDOA and KISS 
to really manage the, the situations because they've got the background, they've got um, the resources right now to be able to do it. Um, so you guys shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, there are there is a new product out called Antics. It's a granular ant bait, um, and it has an organic active ingredient, but it is not OMRI certified. So that's one of the big problems is there is no OMRI certified or approved product um, that will control the ants. So the best thing you can do is prevention, especially if you are a certified organic farm, just don't get them. Be hyper vigilant and put that area, uh, that effort in up front. Um, otherwise, you're kind of screwed. So, those are pretty much the the kind of options for for natural. Um, there's no bio control that is seems to be effective. There was um, a, there is a new introduction of a parasitoid wasp that is a known. Um, parasitoid of little fire ants. It was detected on Big Island. We don't know how far it's spread. Um, it's doubtful that it's on the other islands yet. Um, and there's also no evidence to show that it's even has had any impact on um, the populations in the native range even. So there's no, there's no way to tell if that would even be a viable control method in the future. I hope that answered your question, Jillian. Oh, Heather says lava. So hopefully you guys don't have that issue like we do. <laughs> okay, yeah, very good. Very good question answer session. Thank you. Any can last- I just say, Can I just say one yeah. more kind of closing thought for me? Um, I, all of us touched on surveying. And if you do request a test kit, just know that it's not a problem. We'll send it out to you, but we really hope that you will send it back. And when I started working at the Ant Lab seven or so years ago on the west side, the Kona side of the Big Island, everybody was like, oh, that's, you know, that's a helo problem. That's not going to happen to me. That, that's not my problem. But you know, seven years down the line, it's now their problem. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you guys can leave today with the action and intention to go do a survey of the property, even if it's starting small, you know, even if you only are able to survey a portion at a time, um, chip away at it, but it's gonna be beneficial to you uh, to do so. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we are losing our, our, our participants. So any last minute question, just maybe one. <laughs> Rashad, Rashad yeah. can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so, yes, um, yeah. you know, where the, where the farm, uh, where they surveyed, now that mm -hmm. farmer lives in Kilauea and has his uh, household and surveyed around in, in that residence? So, so this uh, question goes to maybe Craig, Craig then. Craig. Uh, no, not yet. We working at um, the site right now, but not the personal um, home. But we, um, we intend to check their homes, yeah, wherever they drive the cars and go back and forth. That would be a good idea, I would reckon. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Michelle and Craig and Tiffany. And thank you all the participants. It was a very great uh, webinar and it, it's lots of information, good information from Hall and, and whatever uh, uh, here uh, SGOA and, and KISC is doing. With that, uh, I would like to uh, adjourn this webinar. If you have any question, please uh, let me know or contact me. I can uh, connect you to uh, either, either Heather and Michelle. And I think you guys are all familiar with Craig and Tiffany, SGOA and KISC. And with that, uh, thank you. And very good day, good rest of the day. Thanks, Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.
Bye bye. Bye. Hey, I, it's Jillian. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. There was one more question that wasn't oh. answered that I would like to ask, please. Um, okay. So the maps, I'm, I'm hearing that I'll get an email of mm -hmm. all the maps for the mm -hmm. area of Kauai, which I'm very much looking forward to. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, when, how often is this information updated? Okay. Uh, so information <laughs> regarding little fire ants in general, um, we, at, at least at Hawaii Ant Lab, we update pretty regularly. Um, and you can keep, and especially for um, different treatment options and such like that, I'm assuming for Kauai uh, infestations, um, Hawaii Department of Agriculture and Kauai Invasive Species Committee um, do uh, when a new infestation is detected um, and confirmed, they do work together for um, press releases and stuff like that. So um, they try to get info out to the public as soon as possible. Um, but there's no regular scheduled like twice a year or every season or anything like that. Um, they might have newsletters. Do you guys have newsletters, um, HDOA and KISS? Um, we, we do have newsletters if you subscribe to our newsletter and we provide updated information on how the treatments are going once a year, um, on how all the different treatments are going when the last time we found a little fire ant at that site. But we don't update those individual maps that you might be asking if that's the question because yeah. the infestation area doesn't change unless it's gotten larger. Once right. we've done the delimiting surveys, we treat outside, we go beyond that and there's a buffer that we treat from within that. Um, so we shouldn't be extending the LFA uh, treatment site area because we're doing that buffer to make sure we're encompassing all of the LFA. The only way that any of the maps would be updated is because we found an additional site that we have to then put a fourth or fifth um, LFA site on our whole Kauai map. But the individual okay. maps don't get, need to be updated because the area okay. stays about the same. And so am I correct to say, just looking at that map as quickly as I was able to, which I'll look in more depth later when I get them via email, um, the, white perim the white area, is that the perimeter? Is that the buffer zone that you speak of? Um, it's within the red circle, yeah. There is a buffer well, then, zone. But there's, there's multiple different colors the, uh, of, and I'm, I'm concerned because I live literally right near where this infestation um, is. From, from where we find out, uh, from the red dot, um, it's 30 meters away from the red dot, you know. Like okay. We That's treat the that buffer. Area. Yeah, we, we treat it in that area. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. I appreciate okay. that. Thank yeah. you for answering that. I appreciate it. And so I'll look forward to getting those maps and um, 